muted. All right, sorry about that online. Um, can can everybody hear me online now? I'm gonna assume yes. All right, awesome. Great. So again, I'm gonna say welcome everybody to our second meeting. This is the Auto Rob course, Robotics uh, 320 for robotics majors, Robotics 367 for upper level computer science students, and um, and uh, Robotics 511 for for graduate students. Um, we're gonna go ahead. So this is our first interactive session. What we're gonna try to do an interactive session. So it's slated for three hours. That's a long time, uh, but we're really gonna try to make it more interactive. We're gonna try to do more, more things that just help you help show you some robots and help uh, and help your, your learning in a more interactive fashion. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna, we're gonna start to get you ready for project zero, which is the Ross Publisher and Subscriber. So if you have looked on the website, you should see that project zero is now released. It is on the website and ready for you to try. We're gonna do, we're gonna spend a lot of our time doing that today. Um, but, but first, before we do that, we're gonna, we're gonna have Cameron here. This is Cameron. We have, everybody say hi to Cameron. Yeah. With more energy, <laughs> you're gonna make Cameron sad if you give it only that level of energy. Can I get a really big hi, Cameron? One, two, three. Hi. All right, I didn't hear everybody online, you guys. <laughs> you guys gotta start, start talking. All right, I'm just kidding. Stay muted. You can say it in the chat. There we go. Thank you, Isaac, for for uh, for the high Cameron. Um, so Cameron's going to show us how the how what you're going to do for Project Zero applies to the real robot, and so he's going to walk us through a lot of the, the the tools and the software environment for the robot operating system, the ROS system. Then Liz is going to walk you through what you, what you have for uh, for Project Zero and and the nice Docker environment that we've created so that you can write your first publisher and subscriber, see it work with the real robot. Um, just a few notes before we before we go too far. Um, so you'll notice that uh, that if you watch look at the website, I've posted uh, the video and slides for uh, for the for the zero lecture, which is what is a robot. Also the um, the course initialization, robot middleware. I'm still working on it because I I thought I was going to get more done than I than I did. So that's been moved to to Wednesday. Wednesday during the semester is when you're going to see the the lectures released. Those will be videos that you should watch. To be prepared for what we what what we'll do the following uh, following Monday in in the interactive session. So there'll be three videos posted: the robot middleware, path planning, and the Ottawa workflow in JavaScript. Those will those will go online. And because we don't meet next Monday, because Martin Luther King Day, and you should do something uh, uplifting with yourself on, on that Monday, we will we will those will be uh, available for you to to watch as well as next week's um, for uh, for the for the for our next. Uh, course meeting, which will be two weeks from now. And so that's really what things are looking like. Um, you get one week to work on this project. It shouldn't be too complicated. I think we've put something nice together, but uh, but we're going to spend some time today working on it. And so with that, I'm going to pass to Cameron over here, who's going to show you a few things with this with this robot. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Cameron Casalis. I'm a second year PhD student in Professor Jenkins' lab. Um, and like you said, I'm just gonna be showing um, how the stuff that you guys are working on in this first project can directly apply to the real robot. Um, so here we have what's called the fetch robot. It's a mobile manipulator, which means it has a, a wheeled base so it can move around the environment. And then a seven degree of freedom, six degree of freedom arm, I forget off the top of my head, um, used for grasping things and doing sort of manipulation tasks. Um, so, the first thing I'm going to show, um, which is on the projector, yeah, is um, sort of the, it's sort of hard to, okay. Can everybody online, um, no, by the way, for Aaron, uh, you're not to have supposed, you're not to have watched the video lecture, nothing has gone up yet, so, so that's, uh, so that's, that's great. Can everybody online see Cameron's, uh, Cameron's screen? Yeah, I noticed that too. It's, it is a uh, see yes, read no. Um, Cameron, can you describe a little bit about what's going on there? Yeah, so this is um, what's called the RQT graph or basically what we call the node graph. And so this shows all the publications and subscriptions that are running on the robot currently. Um, so like if I hover over, these ovals are a node. If I hover over a node, the blue arrows are inputs. So that's what that node is subscribed to. And then the green arrow, green arrows are outputs. So that's what that node uh, 
publishes. Can I, uh, can, I, can I offer a little background? So because I don't have the robot middleware lecture out just yet, I need to provide a little bit of background on what this is. It will make a lot more sense once I put this video up. But the way that the, ro that the Roth robot operating system works is that what you do is you, you create a bunch of nodes. These nodes do a particular modular function. One may provide the laser scan, may read the laser off the device, provide the laser scan out. In one module, one of these nodes, one of these modules might process a camera image and then tell, recognize faces inside of there. One module might actually generate a plan for the robot to execute some behavior. One might be a controller that, that you'll write that allows the robot to move around and do a random walk. Each of these nodes subscribes to what we call topics. So these are this is information that is that is um, that is sent out. So you can publish a, a command velocity topic, which is a control for the robot. You can publish an image topic. All of these are different different topics that are sent out. And this is how these nodes communicate with each other. So certain nodes publish out certain topics. Other nodes subscribe to those topics. And this is how they all work together to do what's called inter-process communication. So that's how these nodes talk to each other and how they produce the functionality. And so when we boot up the robot that we have right here, these are all the nodes that are talking to each other. I can't even read what that is. So people on Zoom say it's percolated and blurry. I can see what's what's on Cameron's screen and I'm still, I'm still, it's still a lot. Um, so we're not gonna we're not gonna go into that, but this is just this is just showing you one, um, just showing you everything that's running on the robot, right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna write for for Project Zero, you're gonna write one of those nodes that's just gonna subscribe to the laser range scan that's on the robot, on the base of the robot, and then be able to uh, publish out a control command that will allow the robot to to move around. All right, keep going. Yeah, so like Chad said, um, that sort of explains uh, like the what we call pub sub or publisher subscriber framework that Ross is built on. Um, and so I'm going to show an example of that by running uh, my own node here that does um, tele operation with the keyboard. Um, so you can see if I make it bigger. Wait, hold on. We're flipped, and that's why it looked. Uh, that's why it looked bad here. Um, uh, hold on, give me one second. There we go. All right. Hopefully, one person online said that that the look cling on, but it was just backwards. So, all right. Um, yeah. So, what this node is doing is it's. Um, listening to my keyboard and when I press a key like I J K L um, it will then publish a command velocity to the robot and so on the robot side it's subscribing to that command velocity and then we'll move uh, the robot so if I press I the robot will start moving forward and if I press L he'll spin um, spin the other way the carpets are not really the best material for him to go on but you know you can go around um so yeah so that's teleop with the keyboard um just to show like simple functionality of how messages are published and then subscribed to and how that then um creates an action or a movement on the robot side yeah so when Cameron's done doing this demo, we're going to walk through assignment zero. And as you guys are getting Ross set up in your Docker environment, we'll actually be running this uh, node in the Docker environment. So you guys can use this teleop to move fetch around. Um, but instead of sending these commanded velocities to a real robot, you'll have a fetch and simulation. Um, but this is just to point out that all of the development and tutorials we're doing for this assignment are pretty plug and play whether or not you're doing it in simulation versus sending messages to a real robot. Right. Um, yeah, right. yeah. I was just gonna suggest Arviz next. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So next I'm gonna pull up um, Arviz, which is short for ROS visualization. So basically it's a visualization tool that allows you to um, see the different topics that the robot's publishing. So um, a good one, I guess would be uh, the images that the robot's seeing. So um, the head of the robot has um, a camera on it. On that camera, it's publishing um, RGB images that I can make bigger if I find the corner. 
Um, so you can see, um, and if I pull back up, um, let me pull the terminal over here. Um, if I move around, you'll see as the robot moves, uh, images will update as well. Um, so that's, that's one thing we can see. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then what's important to you all as you're going to be moving through this project um, is the base scan. So that's the laser scan that's on the base of the robot. Um, let me just change this to, hold on, and make these bigger. So these pixels or these, yeah, pixels are laser returns from the um, onboard ray. Hold on, let me change this to, uh, yeah. So these are uh, basically returns from the onboard LIDAR um, in 2D. They're kind of messy to see right now. Can you put, can you put robot model in? Yeah. So here we have the robot, um, and then these are returns from the onboard LiDAR. It will be clearer, I think, if I turn the robot towards me um, so that you can see. So like, if I walk in front of it, you can see me walking in front of the robot. Um, and so that's what you all will be subscribing to and then processing um, to build your, your controller. Can you zoom in a little bit? Just yeah, I think it's just two fingers. Oh, so while while he while Cameron's doing that, so you're going to get the laser rangefinder. But one thing that they should also note is that we just loaded the model of the robot uh, in here. That model of the robot, the way it works is that you're drawing. It's actually drawing out the the what we call the forward kinematics of the of the robot. It's taking in all the joint angles and from that generating a what we call transforms that can that can uh, draw the robot the right way. Assignment three and four is you'll be doing that for yourself. And so that's what we're what we're building up to. Can you uh, can you spin it around so so we can see the the laser range? So you can kind of see the 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 laser range as we move it around. You might be able to see to yourself if you're waving at it. You won't be able to see the laser range finder is is on the bottom right here. So it's not uh, so you can't can't really see it so much. But you can see me wave my leg around. You see me see me wave, wave my leg around. I put my right foot in. Put my right foot out. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> And so, so those are the that's the laser range range readings that we can see. Actually, can you drive it a little bit over here just so we can we can see the wall? If you're online, the robot's going to go out of your view for a little bit, but you can get a sense of what's going on. So you can see how we can see the corner of the classroom. We can see the, the laser range readings there that's going around. It has a lot of trouble with, uh, with the desk and the chairs because we don't get a lot of laser range readings there. There we go. All right. Oh, random walk. All right, so now, uh, now Cameron's gonna show you, we, the, what you did for Project Zero was you wrote a random walk controller. Um, actually, before you do that, can we can we uh, can we put it in an advantageous <laughs> situation? Um, so what Cameron's gonna what, what Cameron is gonna show you is we have a random walk controller we we developed, and we're gonna see if it works in here. Fingers crossed. You never know with robot demos what's gonna happen. What the robot's gonna do is it's gonna move forward, and when its laser rangefinder tells us it's, it's gotten too close for something to something, it's gonna spin, and then from there it's gonna it, and once it's clear, it's gonna it's gonna start moving forward again. So, uh, okay. So fingers crossed. Um, okay. So I'm running it now. So it sees the wall. It moves towards the wall. Now it spins around until it finds another object to find. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's getting confused with the chairs, maybe. 
We can also move it. Yeah, I want to kill that. So as Cameron said, there's a channel that is listening to get messages of commanded velocities. And when he was running the, or as he is now running the teleop, it, the teleop node is what is sending those commanded velocities. But when he switches over to this implementation of the wall following, the wall following uh, node has a um, subscriber listening to the base scans, and then it's trying to figure out if there's something immediately in front of the robot and it can drive forward, or if it needs to turn to avoid that obstacle. Okay, so I'll take two, we'll see. I think it's just confused with the. I don't know what it's doing. Everything's too close for a real life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, you'll have more fun in Project Zero. <laughs> Sorry, we can look forward that out. Hey, it's a pretty nice bait blade. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's kill that. Okay. Um, so I do mapping now. Let's do mapping. Okay. So here I can, I can say something. So, so random walk controllers really are not how we want robots to navigate. Um, and so what we want them to do actually instead, and this is going to get to what we, what we're going to talk about in, uh, in project one is really how we can do autonomous path planning. And so in order to do autonomous path planning, we, what we have to do is build out a map and then once we have that map, then we're going to be able to uh, we're going to be able to uh, to do a graph search, and that graph search will be able to allow, allow us to navigate to any location. So what Cameron's going to do right now is build out a build out a map. Um, and so what you can see right here is you're seeing the current laser range scan, and that's populating our initial version of the map, right? And so in the gray area, in the dark gray area are places that are unknown. We can't see those places. We don't know if that's occupied space or free space. The light gray areas are going to be the space that's that is uh that is that we that is free. We believe those spaces be free. And then you'll see little black pixels that are going to represent the boundary. And so, and so as our robot moves around, we're going to be able to build out a good map of our environment. There we go, we can kind of see. So this process of building this map, which running our ROS nodes that do what we call simultaneous localization and mapping. If you're a robotics student, you should already know that. I shouldn't have to tell you, but if you're a CS student, you learned something new today. Um, and so you can see how we built out the front of the classroom here. Uh, Cameron has the robot moving around. You have a question in the back, yeah. It's not going to see the tables. We're reliant on on just the on just the legs of the chairs, your legs in 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 the way. So so we're not going to let this thing run very far. So you can you can see that there's this big table right here, but we're only getting you know we're only getting like sparse readings right there. So that's you know that's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, but that's why we have other sensors, and that's why we we do this is just sort of your entry level slam and navigation. Yes. No, Cameron was controlling that. So, so before we do any, before we do, before we do autonomous navigation, we want to just build out a map. And so he was controlling that via the, via the, via the joystick. And so what he's going to do next is, is then actually be able to send, uh, send a command to actually have the robot navigate autonomously. Right. So can we build more? Yeah. Well, all right, we'll do that, and then we'll build more map. Can we do that? The question over there. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, so usually what this map, so in, in the Ross way, way to do it now, I'm also older. You'll see this when you see the, the when I see the middleware slides, I, I don't use the new versions of Ross. I have the old version of the Ross. And the old version of the Ross, what we do is we get a map, it's represented as an image on the map server. You can just go in and color certain areas and just say, you know, just paint it black as boundary. And then, uh, and then the robot won't go to those, won't go to those locations. So we could just, we could go in and just, just you know, alter the map uh, directly. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Are you taking robotics 530? Yo, you need to ask me out money in that class. <laughs> uh, but no, I, but there's many different ways you can handle, you can handle that dynamic object. It depends on the approach to mapping. So there's many different ways you could do slam. Uh, what you'll learn in what you learn in robotics 330 or ECS 467 or robotics 550 is an occupancy grid based approach. And so you can so you can have dynamic objects burn into the map and then you have to wait for it to, to release. There are also factor graph methods, uh, filtering based methods. Um, there's also, you know, and they, they also have to handle what we, things that we call loop closures. Which is, was I at that? Have I been to this place before? And how can I reconcile that that should be the same place on my map? And so that's a whole other area. We're just showing you the the baseline baseline sort of systems right here. All right, you want you want to send an autonomous command? Yeah. So um, so in Arviz, you can also publish commands. So there's this 2D nav goal. Um, if I click on it, then I can publish a navigation goal. So I'll click. I go to and then I can move the arrow for the the heading that I want the robot to have. Um, so let's just say, well, actually, do you want me to show the path that it plans to? Uh, sure. Um, so first, I'm going to also visualize the path um, that the robot lands. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I could read plan. Okay, so this, all right, so from here, I'll again publish a goal, um, and then you should see a green line show up, and that's the path that the robot has planned to reach that goal. Um, and so then the robot's now moving autonomously um, to reach that point. Um, so you can send it sort of anywhere in the map, and the robot will navigate through the map with avoiding obstacles and reach the goal. Um, I'm gonna ask Cameron to try something ambitious. Can you send it all the way over there? Yeah. Here? Yeah, right there. We'll see if it works. I'm gonna follow it. Take the remote section with me. Or is it um, not yet? I don't think that it's uh, able to plan to uh, unknown area at all. Um, right now, it's getting. It's a quick question. Yeah, question. What's down in the back, right? What what's going on? Like, is it trying to just sort itself out, or? Is there a reason why it would do that? So one thing you should note in Ross navigation is that there's a, uh, that so Cameron's showing you the, the what's called the local cost map right there. So um, so we don't account for this in, in project in project one, but uh, but what's happening is that uh, that you don't just sort of say, well, I could just, you know, grace, I could just sort of navigate right next to, to the chair. You actually want to penalize getting close to close to certain things. And so that cost map is saying, don't get too close to the, to the, um, don't get too close to, to objects that are nearby. And when it's doing that, there's a global plan, which is saying, here's the path that I want you to take. But then there's a local planner that actually has to execute it. And that local planner is saying, I don't want to go there because that's too dangerous. So is that where it deviates from the trajectory label? Yeah. Yep. So think about it like this, like when you're, uh, when you're, here, I'll put that there because my arm is getting tired. Um, so think about this. If you go to Google, if you go to Google Maps, right, and you say, I want to, I want to route to, you know, to Trader Joe's in Ann Arbor, right? They give you the path, but there might be traffic in the way. There may be a pedestrian. You become the local planner that has to execute that and decide how you're going to switch lanes and all the low-level detail that you want to that you're going to execute. And so, what we're going to develop in, in Project One is the low is the global planner. If you want something to work on a robot, you still need a local planner as part of the navigation stack. We got another question over here. Yeah. A star, or something? A star, A star, typically the A star that you're going to develop for Project One. It's good. It's using that. 
or some sort of graph search algorithm. It could be breadth first search. If you're, you know, if you don't want an optimal path, you can get, you can do depth first search. Uh, one of my colleagues suggested iterative deepening, which is depth first search at multiple levels of resolution, which I believe will be an advanced extension as well. Um, and so, so really, this is I, what we're showing you here is just something that gets you an idea of how this robot works, how we publish and subscribe topics, everything in here. We're, we've, you're seeing in our viz all the different topics that that are available. We have publishers and subscribers that are that are commit that are communicating these topics, and that's what lets our our robot operate. And so we'll cover that much, a little bit more in the robot middleware lecture, and we're also going to cover that more um, uh, later later to um, in uh, as we as we go along with uh, with Project Zero. So anything else you want to want to show? Okay. Ah, so somebody's asking, the mapping result is built upon SLAM result or just odometry? Uh, it's building on the SLAM result, not just odometry. So what you'll notice with this, if you take one of the SLAM courses, the map, the navigation courses, that uh, that using odometry is good for a little while and then it drifts away. And so the SLAM result is really what we need to build this. For project one, we're not going to do SLAM, we're just going to have a planning scene that can tell us when we're in collision or not collision. All right. All right. Nah, that's okay. I think people got the got the point. Um, but any questions before we let Cameron go and thank him for thank him for his time. All right. Thank you very much, Cameron. All right. So now that we've done that, we're gonna go through and Liz is gonna walk you through what we're gonna do for project zero. So for project zero, we're gonna build out, we have a Docker image that has a pre-installed version of ROS on it. Liz is gonna walk you, walk you through that. And then, uh, and just so you can see what that, what that looks like and, uh, and then be ready to do that for yourself. You're not taking the robot away, are you? Okay, <laughs> all right. Whoa. Whoa. And then I can screen share. Yeah. All right, um, so we just wanna kind of go over some logistic parts first with the website. So as Chad said, assignment zero has been added. And because this is a particularly newly added assignment, we're including the instructions on a separate document. Um, but the big thing to note is that if you had looked at the website previously, like even as soon as yesterday, and you started to get going with this, um, you probably actually cloned the wrong repo. So as you're doing um, this assignment, make sure you are cloning from my repo. You should see winter 23 in there. Um, and you should also see a subfolder of the repo that's called Ross. So just as a quick overview um, with this assignment is it gives some introduction to what we'll be doing with Ross. Um, and uh, Cameron demoed it, but it was a little too cluttered of a space to see it well. We're gonna be implementing a wall following controller for fetch and the random walk. Mm. Okay, um, I would, yeah. Um, so here's just kind of like a brief uh, video of that. Um, the things that you're gonna need for this assignment is to install Docker. Um, so that can be something that you guys work on now. Um, you'll also need Git of some kind, um, and then you'll need to um, clone the KinneyVal repo. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the logistics of this in just a second, but basically um, we'll be building a Docker image, um, and so this will have an Ubuntu 
operating system installed, as well as ROS installed, and some of the packages that we need for Gazebo, the simulation environment, and particular tools for interfacing with the Fetch robot. We're going to run that Docker image as a container. And then through your web browser, you'll be able to um, interact with the Ubuntu, Ubuntu desktop. So um, this way you can click things, use, key use your keystrokes to operate the robot. Um, and so with just getting started, we're going to do the teleop demo that Cameron did on the robot in our simulation environment. So you'll be able to use your keyboard to operate fetch and you can see it drive around. Um, and then this will get into instructions for how you can implement um, this ROS node. Um, so as I was saying earlier, we're going to have a uh, subscriber that is listening to the base scans um, and trying to interpret if there is an obstacle directly in front of the robot. And then based on that, it will either give a forward drive command or a left turn command. Um, and you'll be implementing a publisher to send those commanded velocities. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so. Can you make that bigger though? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can you, uh, can you, oh, yes. can you share the desktop? So um, this is my cloned um, kidney valve stencil repo. And the sanity check you guys want to do to make sure you installed the correct one is that there should be a folder called ROS, R-O-S, in this repo. And if not, you probably cloned from last semester. Um, so make sure you're grabbing the correct link off the website. And then we can go into the ROS folder. And then... From here, um, this is some of the source files for starting your Docker image, as well as the file structure and some template code for the node that we'll be writing. Um, but you should just be able to, uh, once you have um, Docker installed, um, you're going to, and once you build the image, then you should just be able to call this uh, bash script which runs a container of the uh, image, and then you can connect to it through your web browser, and it will open up a Ubuntu desktop for you. So clicking in the bottom left-hand corner, we have this start menu, and we can open terminals. Um, okay, sorry. Um, So as I said, this already has ROS and everything installed. Um, and so when Cameron was doing the demo, he was sending messages to the real robot, um, but we'll be able to open up a simulation environment in this Docker container through something called Gazebo. So with that, we're just gonna call ROS launch and then Gazebo Fetch, wait, gazebo. Fetch gazebo, and then playground.launch. Yeah. So this is, um, initializing a fetch robot in the uh, environment. And then you can, oops. So then if we want to rerun the um, teleop demo that Cameron run, ran, it'll just be Ross run 
Teleop keyboard twist, and then, so this is running. One thing to note is for this Teleop demo, the terminal that is running it has to be your most forward terminal to get it to receive keyboard commands, but then you can uh, move it around with your keyboard. So this is the exact same um, node that Cameron was running. It's just that we're sending it to fetch in a simulation environment instead of on the real robot. Um, and so something to note is this Docker is running a virtual environment for us. Uh, yep. Um, but to make things easier, um, the file system that you've cloned with your repo is actually being linked into your Docker image. So it's not just passing through a copy of your files, it's linking onto your local file system. So what that means is you can edit files on your local computer. You don't have to edit them within the Docker image. As long as you save them on your local computer, they will automatically be updated within the Docker image. Conversely, if you delete things inside of the Docker image, you'll be deleting files on your local system. Um, but that should make it a little bit easier for implementing things. And then you'll also have all of the authentication uh, set up on your, on your local computer for pushing to Git. Um, yeah. Oh, camera controls, yeah. Um, so the camera controls might vary slightly depending on um, which uh, base operating system you have. Um, but if you wanna move around in Gazebo, you wanna make sure that that is the most active um, pop-up but you should just be able to use a mouse wheel or on Mac, I'm using two fingers to zoom in and out. Um, and then you can click and drag to move, um, to translate the scene. And then you can also either do control click or shift control click let's hold this, um, to be able to rotate the scene around. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where the robot went. Um, we can just reopen it. Can I take any questions on this so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We might. We'll show you, we'll just show you the random walk controller. And after this, in about 10 minutes or so, we'll we'll sort out all these issues with the class. I have to say that this is so as we start to become a new new program and we and then we're trying to make this uh like a true op robot operating systems course. This is a new project that we inserted. So so Liz has worked overtime to try to get this in place. And so we've still got some bugs and we got got some things to work out. But I think it's really cool to just see see things working. So we're gonna we're gonna try to we're gonna try to sort out all those issues with GitHub Classroom and and so forth. Um, and so she's gonna I think she's gonna run her random walk controller right now. So what she's doing right now is she's just built her controller. She's setting, she's saying source, which is going to set up the environment variables for her. And now she's going to launch her controller, which is going to, which is going to make her robot do something. Although we lost the robot. <laughs> okay. She's zooming out so we can see it move. Too far. <laughs> Thank you. 
So now her controller is working. Yeah, so this is what you guys will be implementing, but it's reading the base scans. There's nothing directly in front of it. So it's publishing forward commanded velocities. It gets close to the wall and it detects that the wall is in front of it. So instead of driving forward, it will turn left and you'll see it just sort of walk around the um, simulated environment following this like pretty basic controller. Okay. Um, so I think at this point, um, this is just kind of an overview of what we'll be doing. Um, but we're reserving the rest of class time today to get everyone started. So we'll we'll double check whatever this GitHub Classroom issue we have is, um, but go ahead and make sure you have Git and Docker installed. Um, and we have a lot of course staff here today to kind of walk people through. Um, implementing these publishers and subscribers, it's only gonna be about 10, 15 lines of code. So this first assignment shouldn't be anything too crazy. It's just making sure that you're able to clone the repo, push to it, um, and we can get stuff going. All right. So with this, if you can, if you can find the assignment on the web page, go to that and start uh, and start working on it. Uh, that's where we're gonna. That we're, that's where we're gonna spend the rest of our our interactive session doing. Um, yeah. Add, Liz wants to add one more thing. So on the Autorob website, if you go to the schedule, this is where we're posting lectures and slides. Typically, we have the first lab used um, for getting people started with Git. Um, things are a little bit different this semester, but you can still go to view this, um, this these slides. So if you're not familiar with Git, this will give you some um, basic intro with how to use it and walk you through getting started with this assignment. Um, and then in the assignment description for zero, it will link you to this page and you can start to kind of follow that. Okay. All right. And, uh, and so if you, uh, so, so with that, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and, and stop. If you were going to open up, can you, can you have your slide? Can you put the slide up? We're going to open up the office hours queue. If you have, if you have specific questions that we have to answer individually, we will, uh, you can sign up for a, for a slot on the office hours queue and we'll try to we'll try to get you started as as best as possible so that is the that is the link to the office hours queue right there um we're going to open it in just a second um it so can can somebody tell me what the issue they're having with github classroom is uh 